romantic and I am this is wrong or this is right. Um, so I actually I enjoyed it a lot. I loved the banter too. It was just really crazy. I wish that they had done a little throwback to the chocolate eating. You know, they did talk about the eating of brains and organs and stuff, but you know, venom is notorious for also just binging on chocolate. It's the same chemistry as brains. And so I think the only point in the movie that I kind of kind of came out of it, because it's only when you go against your own universe of science, like I'm like, wait a minute, was when Venom comes off of him and he's looking at him and he still has the teeth and the eyes, and I'm like, well, if it's not Eddie Brock's teeth and eyes, he really should just be a blob. He shouldn't actually have teeth and eyes. But theatrically, it was really cool to say pizza. I liked it. Overall, I was very happy. So, obviously, Venom's initial host that we saw in the comic book series was Peter Parker. And what's very interesting about Venom is he was actually first designed to be a suit that was self-healing for Spider-Man because no one wants to think of Spider-Man in the corner like sewing everything. I do as someone that designs wardrobe, but no one else does, I guess. So in this, though, we get to actually see him with Eddie Brock, and we get to see that full bromance developing. Now, one of the things that they do touch on in the movie is actually how the noises bother them with the high pitches and the high frequencies. And that's actually how Spider-Man got them off of him to begin with. Um, and as a scientist, I like that because it's like, wait a minute, well, the symbiote is not going to be hearing it if he doesn't have someone else's ears, but it's actually the vibrations is what, I, what I'm thinking. What did you guys think of that way that they actually portrayed that theatrically? Well, I don't science, so I was pleased that they at least stuck with the canonical idea that it's noises. But like you said, um, if they're switching to frequency, so it's more about vibration, and that's about as far science as I can get on this. So, <laughs> so I mean, again, I do science. So <laughs> it's, I mean, noise is fundamentally a vibration. Sound is just the air vibrating. So it's, I'm completely cool with that. Uh, my only, I guess, maybe complaint, but I'm, I'm also cool to go with it. But my maybe complaint is that an MRI machine doesn't really vibrate. Mm. But you know, I, I'm willing to look past that because, again, MRIs are loud and sound is vibration. So it's, I'm, I was cool with that. And he, he did have, you know, Eddie Brock's ears at that yeah, point. Yeah, so yeah, I was going to definitely go with that. So, so Katha, how do you feel about thinking about a superhero sitting at home at night darning his, his suit? I have always found the montages in the movies where Spider-Man became like the ultimate cosplayer like overnight as soon as he, you know, defeated Bonesaw and all of a sudden he's like goes from a sweatshirt to like, you know, the ultimate in spandex and puffy paint. Um, as someone who struggles on the daily with different materials, especially spandex, I was mildly offended by how easily he picked up that skin. <laughs> um, so I, I don't, but you know, like they get offended by science, I get offended by them like making their costumes so darn easily. So. <laughs> would you would you handle the banter if it meant that you could just have a suit that you're like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna be Carrie Keller right now. Okay, now we're gonna we're gonna go meet Venom. Okay, Spider-Man, can you just keep changing your colors? Well, I think it's a trade-off. Like, um, if I have to keep beating up his heads in order to have like the world's best cosplay, I think morally I might have some difficulty with that. But um, it is very tempting to have sort of a friend who's in my head talking to me and also can just like provide me with like the perfect you know con outfit every day. And then I'm like, oh, I'm tired of wearing this, and then I'm just like in my t-shirt and shorts. That'd be awesome. <laughs> maybe, maybe we could do a little eyes on these set up, and they could just be like a certain story that's not yes. as really like bonding. Okay. So obviously we all know that it's a chicken and egg story, right? Like sci-fi inspires science, and science inspires sci-fi. So what's really cool is actually Spider-Man was the first to inspire what we now know as the tracking bracelets that people wear when they get put on house arrest. So it's a really interesting story, but the technology was developed, but was never really adopted widely until um, one of the governors in New Mexico was like, oh, we're going to solve this problem of incarceration. How do we, you know, maybe let people be home and be rehabilitated instead? And he saw a Spider-Man comic and actually like, put it on. So is there any cool tech that you guys saw in the, the Venom film that you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that home more and have that? So it's, I saw a lot of stuff about self healing And it's, I actually, in my research, I'm sitting and thinking a bunch about self-healing electronics because it's in an electronic circuit. It's not the, you know, the matrix or whatever that's 
so difficult to self heal. It's the actual electron phase. So we've been looking at how you can actually use liquid metals to be the electronic bits of your circuit. So this is a puddle of liquid metal, and if you can modify the liquid, you can change its shape by applying little voltages to it. And you can do special things like you can pattern it. So it's, this is your liquid metal in a maze-shaped set of channels, and like it's just a plastic, it's a stretchy plastic. So it's, you could imagine using a voltage to pump it into these channels over here and pump it into these channels over here. So it's, you could have your electronic device morphing as you wear it. It gets even better, though. So it's, this also lets you make really stretchable electronics. So this is some headphone wires that are just stretching by over double its length because the circuits in them are made of a liquid metal. And I think the best part of this is this one over here. Here we go, okay. So this one is actually self-healing. So this is the lid of an LED, and the liquid metal is in the little rectangular plastic bit. And we're gonna take and cut it with scissors. And when we cut it with scissors, you know, when you break the circuit, the LED goes out. But what we're going to do is we're going to take and we're going to press it back together and press it back together with our fingers. The LED will come back on and then you let it sit for a couple of minutes. And after you let it sit for a couple of minutes, it'll be back to the same strength it was before. Wow, so basically you could get that impenetrable nature and that self-healing kind of you get with the, you know, the venom-based symbiosis suit with an actual material today? Yeah, absolutely. So is this commercially available or is it still in development? This is, this is still in development. Okay. It's, you know, if, you know, if you look at this video, it's, there's a, oh, we cut out about time, 10 minutes when it's self-healing. So there's a lot of development, which is why we need more good scientists to come join us. And in. <laughs> you guys can have the answer. Yeah, <laughs> just have to start thinking. But it's really promising. Awesome. So obviously, fans of the Venom comics know that Eddie, again, was a secondary stop along the route, and Venom has been in everyone from Miss Marvel, the group, to Gwen, to Spider-Man, even Deadpool, which Deadpool was like, this is really mean to do to Venom, so I should let them go, because no one deserves this nice. So do you all have a favorite mashup with Venom? I don't know. I just, I really, I always like symbiote suit attached to Peter Parker and the struggle he went through slowly realizing uh, the horror of it because this was the first exposure to it. Now, like, everybody's like, you get a Venom and you get a symbiote and you get a Carnage and, you know, oh, we've got their rainbow colors. But in the first time, just watching Spidey, like, when he woke up and found himself, like, in the suit and, like, in another location, um, that's always just been my favorite because it's, like, slowly dawning horror for a character who's usually very lighthearted and he's really struggling with the power of the suit. It's sort of intoxicating and almost like an addiction that he has to come overcome, which wasn't something that dark that we associated with Spider-Man because he was always, you know, our quippy neighborhood, you know, friendly neighborhood web slinger. So that's still my favorite. It's just the original, the original combining. So this is, again, I had to you know, kind of shamelessly take a poll of my graduate students, <laughs> and they were completely unanimous. And uh, so, so they said that the correct answer here is Gwena. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and they said that there was no argument allowed, and that had to be my answer. Nice. OK, well, I like that you, you get the data, you know, yeah. and have some observing other people. When you some research. <laughs> that is really cool. I think, you know, speaking of what you were talking about, because like, it kind of speaks to like the the consent, you know, mm -hmm. whereas Eddie, Eddie Brock kind of like over time, he says, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to go out and we're, we're going to eat brains sometimes, but it's only going to be bad guys, right. versus Peter Parker not really having that opportunity. He thought he was just getting a really cool new biotech suit, and instead he was kind of being taken over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's just something to be said for the dichotomy of taking a really lighthearted character and then subjecting them to an experience that has a parallel with addiction or some other social issue. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things about co co comics is taking a serious social issue
issue, but integrating it into the, sort of this more palatable medium that even kids can consume, and they might make the parallel of like, if something seems too easy or too powerful, don't just take it at face value, maybe you want to question it. So, I don't know, I just really like the application of it, just taking Sweet Peter and tempting him with all this power. And, that, and that's actually a really cool point, though, because the reason why Venom and Eddie Brock came together so well is it was actually a match made in hatred, right? Yeah, Eddie Brock hated Peter Parker, and Venom hated Spider-Man, and so while that's not really spoke to in the film, we know historically that that's how that first happened. Um, and that banter that we were talking about earlier is one of my favorite parts, and as a viral specialist, it made me so excited that Venom would get mad every time he'd be called a parasite. He's like, I'm not a parasite. And so it's really interesting because in the comics and in the film, obviously they call that um, he's, he's an alien race and he's a symbiote, but it really mimics symbiosis and parasitism. And the whole reason that he gets mad about being called a parasite is because a parasite's not a benefit benefit relationship. He sees himself as a mutualistic thing. He's making Eddie Brock stronger, he's giving him all of these different adaptations that are going to make it so that he's going to be self enabled to save himself, he's going to be self healing. But Venom is actually, if he's not eating someone else's brain, going to have to feed off the organs, which we see in the film start to happen. And so that balance between mutualism and parasitism is something that's, that's very interesting. And I did not include visuals because, believe me, you do not want to see what I saw when I was Googling parasites <laughs> and mutualistic tendencies. But some really cool mutualistic uh, relationships that exist are like Finding Nemo. You know, you've got clownfish and sea anemones. So the clownfish gets the protection of the anemone, and then they're actually in there, and they're giving the anemone the things that they need. And then there's also the whole mutualistic parasitism kind of switch of the yellow-billed ox pecker. So if you guys have ever seen oxes, they always have these birds on them. And these pecker, these um, ox peckers will actually eat the parasites off the oxes. So it seems like that's a really good mutualistic relationship. But over time, if they get thirsty, they'll actually start cutting the oxes to get blood from them. So that's a very quick shift from a mutualistic to a parasitic relationship, which we kind of see in the other um, symbiotes that are in the film, because Venom, again, is trying to be a, a pro for pro, but there are the pro for negatives. Um, and then you can also see the opposite occur when you have like your um, parasitism of like, a female mosquito fighting us. She's just trying to feed her young. She doesn't care if, if we're having any negative implications. Um, but it's one of those things that I just love. I get so mad every time. And that's the science that I was like, yes, love this. We keep pointing it out because overall, Venom is more mutualistic because he is trying to not be parasitic. He wants to help him. He wants to build him up. And that's something as that relationship, that romance continues to evolve. I hope we see more of. And just to give you guys a kind of real application of something very Venom-like, all of us in our guts have what we call a biome that helps us digest things and take care of things. And it really is, it's kind of weird because it's a 10 to 1 ratio of biome to us. And our gut, like there is literally 100 trillion different types of bacteria in your guys' guts right now. So when you look at that, um, definitely keep hoping that he's going to stay good because that's what you got to hope for things in your guts. <laughs> sometimes they're guts, sometimes they're meat. <laughs> So, but enough about the science. You've got an amazing demo for us, right? Because the thing is, is that we, we, we're talking about future developed tech, and we're talking about alien tech, but you have some real Earth material tech that could help us become Venom-like, right? Yes. So, share that? when you look at different Venom cosplays or on the screen, like you got muscles, you got teeth, you got big eyes, but what's the real deal? Like, what's the number one thing you associate with Venom? the oozing, the tendrils. And so that's the effect that I think a lot of people could struggle with, is I mean, you can order a Zentai suit online, you can build a muscle suit, and I'll be happy to talk about construction of those too. But making the oozy tendrils, that was the part that I want to focus on. So I made a little little female friend over here. Nope, she's pretty light. Last year, 
Macy's went out of business, so I just thought, hey, oh. let's bring her in. All right. Last year, Macy's went out of business locally, and they had a sale on mannequins. I think Sergey told me they were having a sale. Ran down there and bought a bunch. I've got a male night wing in my house, and now I've got a female venom. So the first thing I did was, when I think about venom, you can definitely get sort of that oozy, shiny texture. I was going for more of a matte texture right now, just to get this effect. So I masked off half the um, mannequin um, with Plasti Dip, which is a spray rubberized coating that you can get in an aerosol can at Lowe's Home Depot online. It's about $7 a can. Um, when you are using Plasti Dip, it is a spray coating. Um, you want to heat the can by just putting it in some warm water, not hot water. Don't put it on the stove. Don't put it in the microwave. Please don't. It's under pressure, so don't be dumb. Um, so then you're going to spray it. Um, it only takes about two to three layers. It dries really quickly. That's the base flat coat on here, and it's a, it's a nice tactical look. And then I just hand painted the symbiote on here. I actually masked off half of her, just covered her with some plastic wrap. And then how to get these tendrils. Um, these are actually just some uh, wire that I picked up at Home Depot. I think it's about 12 gauge. Um, the higher the gauge, the thinner the wire. So you want something that you can manipulate into whatever shape you want, and this is all adjustable. Um, and then in order to get the texture, I sprayed the wire, because it's wire, so it's very slick, it doesn't really have a surface to grab onto. I sprayed it with Plasti Dip, just to give it a rubberized coating and something with a little texture to it. And then um, I went and got a, a bucket of, of just raw Plasti Dip, not in an aerosolized can, but just in a regular can, so it's just liquid rubber. So I got that, and I also got my trusty hot glue gun. And that's all you need is Plasti Dip, wire, and hot glue. So I use so much hot glue, I have so many blisters on my hands right now. Um, so it was, you have to coat the wire with Plasti Dip, and then you can go over it with hot glue. And I've even got like little tiny hot glue tendrils right here. And these are just three different sets of wire that I did. So I can actually take this off. You can have this come around the neck. You can put more wire in here so it looks like it, the tendrils are coming over the face. I've wrapped it around her. This is all completely adjustable, and since it's rubber, it's also flexible. So as you move these pieces, it's not going to like peel off. Now, um, of course, too much manipulation, you know, eventually things will start to break down with this stuff. But you can make this in any shape you want. If you just want a piece that wraps around your arm or something that wraps around your whole body, uh, this whole bill cost about $15. That was it. So doing uh, using a rubberized coating or any sort of flexible paint treatment is really going to be useful if you're walking around in your outfit. Uh, and then if you want to make the face, there's uh, face shells, Spider-Man face shells that you can download blueprints for online. It's basically sort of a face dome, okay? And you don't necessarily have to build the whole mask. It's up to you. There's so many ways to do it. Um, and you don't have to make it out of you know, paper, warbler, foam. You can make it all sorts of stuff. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there. But um, a really nice effect to have is to only like, build it, but then cut out part of the face so that you can see the human features shining through. Then you can do a little bit of hot glue, not while you're wearing it, please. Hot glue is hot. It's not good. Um, and for teeth, because Ben's got those teeth, really nice and simple solution is fake nails. Just fake acrylic nails from like CVS or any beauty store. Um, if you go to beauty supply stores, you can get lots of fake nails really cheap compared to like CVS or Target. Um, there's just a lot of different materials, but I found YouTube is a really, really great um, resource for getting creative ideas because people on there are always experimenting with different materials and they're generously just sharing it with you. So I saw a guy talk about um, using a wire armature and then I was like, mm, not goopy enough for me. So that's when I started getting out the rubber and the hot glue. So. And to clarify, when you say um, the fake nails, you're meaning on the part that's not your face, right? Yeah. So a lot of people, yeah. If, well, if you want to glue fake nails to your face, you will need to use cosmetic, skin-friendly adhesive, like Prose, or um, you could use liquid latex as long as you have the appropriate remover. Or you could use spirit gum. Um, I personally don't like to put spirit gum on my face. 
Um, you never get enough spirit gum remover to go with it, and I have wound up having to pull too hard and leave abrasions on my face. You need to, but if you're ever going to put any of those facial adhesives, always do a test on a different part of your body. If you have a latex reaction or any sort of adhesive reaction, they'll just, they'll just get crazy and start slapping things on your face first, okay? Well, you were saying they sell a lot of the suits too, and I was um, reading, uh, or I was actually watching another customer did where they put like puff paint. Yes, puff paint is really popular. So if you're not necessarily going to go full goop, but you want more texture, a lot of Spider-Man or Venom, Spider-Man Universe cosplayers, Batman, Superman, any of the ones that have the raised lines, there's just very detailed puff paint application. And you can pick up puff paint really cheaply at any craft store, Joanne's, Michael's, but then you might want to invest in a really fine bottle that you move it into with like a needle tip for really fine application. But yeah, puff paint is a really great way to add texture, and you could also get that goopy effect if you decided to sort of color outside the lines. Thank you. And so I hear you have a really fun little material with you that you wanted to show us. You, in fact. So, it's, so I talked a little bit already about self-healing stuff, but it's, I didn't talk that much about something that's, that has that goopy look, but also is, can be impenetrable. So how many people have heard of Ublek? So I brought a big container of Ublek, and I've been walking around with this in my purse, which has been a little awkward. Um, so Ublek, if you're not familiar, is a non-Newtonian fluid. So it's a liquid, which is just a popsicle stick. Oh, yeah, thank you. So Ublek is a liquid, just liquid, it's drippy, nothing weird, but if you apply your force a little bit faster and you start to stab it, it behaves like a solid. Yeah, we can feel the table shaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not just faking that I'm stabbing it. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty shocking. So it's, I can't actually just set the stick in here because it will sink all the way in and I will lose it. Um, so the way this works, this is Ublek, if you haven't ever made it, it's just cornstarch in water. So it's basically little particles suspended in a liquid. And this sort of non-Newtonian fluid that gets thicker and harder to deform as you apply force harder and faster, it's the premise of a lot of experimental body armor. It's that way your armor is super flexible, unlike something like a metal plate, but it'll still stop you know, some sort of bladed weapon, it can still stop some projectile weapon like a bullet. Really, really fabulous. You just have to go from something like cornstarch, which is perhaps not an engineering material, uh, to something that's a little bit more controlled in how you manufacture it. And don't ever do a water balloon fight with water balloons that are full of this. It hurts a lot. It hurts a lot. <laughs> They're very, very good here and they're cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. Well, we want to be able to hear from all of you and take questions. Um, so on the screen, you can see everyone's Twitter handles. So definitely follow us in our adventures. But in the meantime, any questions? Oh yeah. I'm just wondering, like, I really like how symbiotes they kind of have evolution to them, like just from one symbiote to its next bond. Like, for example, like Venom has his own powers, and like Carnage has like. Can, Kind of has like high, can like spread across a bunch of people. A comic called like Carnage USA took over an entire town and had a hive man through all of them. And like a new, more recent like Spawn of Venom, like a sleeper symbiote, could even like do chemokinesis where it could like um, make people go to sleep by creating chemicals that like that like uh, induce sleep or like make kind of mind control the suggestions of certain like hormones and like help its invisibility by like making people less aware of it. I just like the idea, like how it's really quick evolution. Like the evolution takes millions of years, but symbiotes just even the same symbiote having different spawns has like different abilities that way. Yeah, so um, I always look at things like from a biomimicry standpoint when I see really cool superpowers in um, comics, and that actually is very similar to like what viruses do, right? Like they evolve so rapidly, which is why it's so hard to actually, you know, pinpoint 
exactly which strain of like a flu virus you're going to get each year, right? We all know Con Crow is a thing, wash your hands. Um, but but and it's very cool that as they explore what Venom does in his offspring of Carnage, who obviously leaves behind because he had no actual like attachment to him, um, that evolution to me is very, very cool. And it reminds me a lot of the viral world. But also, if you're dressed like Venom or any part of the Spider-Verse, please say we're going to do a photo at the end. They see any hand up there, go up in the depth, there you go. Yep, that's you. Yep. You look at Yep. Do you know why Spider-Man wasn't in the Venom movie? Why was Spider-Man not in the Venom movie? Do we have some theories? Well, I do know that, uh, I mean, this is just my own postulation based on being a super nerd consumer of, like, the movies, is that uh, Sony and Marvel sort of jointly share Spider-Man right now. Like, uh, there was this, quote, sunset clause in Sony's relationship to Spider-Man that they have to make a, a Spider movie every certain number of years, or they lose the rights to Spider-Man and it reverts back to Marvel entirely. But Sony's working with Marvel movie studios now to help make the movies because Sony has put out some turkeys and Marvel's doing a little better. So um, the fact that there's a really complicated relationship between those two uh, movies they, I think they just decided they didn't want to necessarily hash it out just to make the Venom movie. They can always bring Venom in at a later date if they saw that the movie did well. Because this was a risky movie to make without awesome popular Spider-Man and Tom Holland, who's like such an adorable Spider-Man. He's so great. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe they just didn't, they didn't wanna, um, they want to, they took a chance with Venom. I think it totally paid off. I'm like, bring me, give me more Venom. So I think we may see Venom and Spider-Man meet up again in the movies. I, I would really, really like that and wash the face of Spidey 3 out of my memory. I do, I do think that little nod towards Carnage at the end yes. kind of shows why we would need to bring Spider-Man back, right? Because that's when Venom and Spider-Man join forces to take on Carnage. So. I could also see that Venom might ditch Eddie when he sees Spider-Man and he thinks this guy has a lot of powers already, which might be appealing to him. You know, that Eddie's just a human, but he's got this really powerful person over here that he could latch onto. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Venom, you know, jump post to something a little more appetizing. <laughs> Yeah, let's go eat. Let's let's go eat like a whole movie theater. Let's go. 
We should walk down the street and start eating people because it feeds the um, uh, carnage is just hungry. But this guy, his hunger is for uh, other people's agony. So um, they all, it's fun to see the different personalities appear as they bond to different people and sort of feed off or amplify those personality traits that uh, sort of define the human host. And I think also he, to your point about the parasitism, I think that Carnage isn't going to have to be as parasitic because he's going to have an ample diet provided because there's not going to be that moral coding question of are they a bad guy or are they a good guy, whereas Venom is going to have to basically be on a diet with Eddie Brock because it's going to be who Eddie chooses, which may be why, you know, in the comics, you know, Venom does turn to chocolate instead because he needs something to subside his, his dietary needs. So Carnage is going to be able to grow big and strong because he's constantly feeding himself. Uh, 
how much force it pushes back with. So it's, I'm, I'm hesitant to say this, but if you want to stick around afterward and you want to come look at yourself, go, go ahead. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of really cool videos on YouTube of people playing with this. Like uh, they filled up a, a kiddie pool, and so when they ran across it, they could run across the surface, but when they slowed down, they'd start to sink. It was, yeah. and I was just like, I want to fill a kiddie pool before it started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you have a big enough oobleck pool and you just walk across it, you will sink and it's like quicksand. It'll, it'll try to keep it. Yep. In the beginning of the movie, that yellow symbiote that they put in the rabbit, whatever happened to that rabbit? I think, I mean, when I saw the yellow symbiote, all I could think of was the female yellow Through something, he's like, What did I just do? That was kind of cool and kind of terrifying. 
And it's definitely something that you see, and again, in the viral world, you know, viruses go and they, they hijack their own cells so that they can then utilize your replication process. So it makes sense in how Venom's able to have him heal rapidly, he's able to boost all of his systems. So if he's able to then start like metabolizing all of these things faster for him, it's, it would be very in line with what you see in normal viruses. When you have your muscles, your muscles use sort of two different chemicals for fuel. They use ATP for fuel, which is like in the super short term, and then glycogen when you're going sort of, uh, toward more like anaerobic or more aerobic type stuff, so like long distance running. Uh, so it's, I really like the idea that the that venom is taking in this biomass and just much more efficiently converting it into fuel for you know Eddie's muscles much more efficiently than Eddie's body could do by itself. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question and then we'll have everyone again here dressed up like a spider universe, bottom universe, come down and we'll get a picture. Go ahead. Um, how long do you think it would take for mail or liquid mail to something that would help a regular So in terms of could we build something that worked, it's we could probably do that today. Uh, the big concern and actually the, the aspect of the problem where I'm working is, have it, has anyone done the demo where you take liquid gallium and you put it on like an aluminum soda can? Has anyone seen that? So a few people. So it's, if you take that liquid metal I showed and put it on something made of aluminum, it catastrophically degrades the mechanical properties. So it's, I can take, and once I put some gallium under my aluminum soda can, I can tear the aluminum soda can in half. Uh, and it's, I almost brought that in today. <laughs> uh, so it's a big safety concern. That's kind of why it's not in Know, devices like phones for your consumers today. Uh, so what I'm working on in my research is actually looking at how we can mitigate that, how we can make it much safer to put it into stuff like phones, stuff like smartwatches. Because I want my smartwatch to be self-healing. I think that'd be awesome. As long as it doesn't bother with you, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all for coming out to see Science of Venom with all of us and definitely follow our adventures on social media. And if, again, if you're in a costume, come up. We want to get a big group photo. So thank you all. Thank you.